Welcome to the Fast Leader Podcast, where we uncover the leadership life hacks that help you to experience breakout performance faster and rocket to success. And now, here's your host, customer and employee engagement expert, and certified emotional intelligent practitioner, Jim Rimbach. Call Center Coach develops and unites the next generation of call center leaders. Through our e-learning and community, individuals gain knowledge and skills in the six core competencies that is the blueprint that develops high-performing call center leaders. Successful supervisors do not just happen. So go to callcentercoach.com to learn more about enrollment and download your copy of the Supervisor Success Path eBook now. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, today I'm excited because we're gonna have somebody on the show today who's gonna be able to give us a very, very comprehensive look into workforce engagement. Lonnie Wilson was born in Kellogg, Idaho, and spent his formative years from the age of nine to 22 in Spokane, Washington. He had a pretty typical family, mom, dad, and three sisters. He was the second oldest. However, his oldest sister died of cancer at 34, making him the senior sibling. His two, two younger sisters are both authors, and his dad died in 1988 at 68, but his mom lives in Spokane and is still perking at 97. His dad was the ultimate do-it-yourself kind of guy. He grew up on a farm and was incredibly capable. He taught Lonnie a lot about fixing things, and Lonnie was also working with him on some project around the house at all times. Lonnie was always a good student, so coupling the fixer mentality and some decent academics, he became a chemical engineer. From there, he went on to management and now teaches managers. Lonnie worked for Chevron for 20 years in refining and had great teachers, coaches, mentors, role models in management and personnel development. While with Chevron, he became very interested in lean manufacturing and decided to start a second career as a consultant in cultural change. Now he focuses not on just lean management, but on the human side of lean, what Toyota calls respect for people. Lonnie says his legacy is his kids and his books and a whole slew of soccer players he coached over the years, who still stop by and write and, and to stay in touch with Coach. Lonnie currently lives in El Paso, Texas, and is married with four adult children. The youngest one is in college, and three others are married and combined have given Lonnie and his wife, Roxana, seven grandkids aged 15 to four months. Lonnie Wilson, are you ready to help us get over the hump? Oh, yes. Anxious. Uh, I'm glad you're here. Now, I've given my legion a little bit about you, but if you could, Tell us what your current passion is so that we can get to know you even better. Well, my current passion is lean manufacturing, uh, teaching it uh, and, and creating a, a new and a different culture in a business, a culture where they, they not only satisfy their clients, but they satisfy their, their, their suppliers and they keep the people in the facility happy. Um, it's easy enough if they do it properly to, have a good workplace with high morale and make a buck. Most definitely. And, and your book is, you know, sustaining workforce engagement. And, and I mentioned to you, for those who are watching on video can see that this book is very comprehensive. I mean, it talking about, you know, that engineer's mind coming through, you know, in the pages, it's, it's quite extensive. And so I, I initially asked you, I said, who's using this as a textbook? Uh, and I would dare to say that you're going to have significantly more using it as a textbook. Uh, than, than you do have right now for certain because when you start looking at you know really the mechanics of workforce engagement and here's the thing when I start thinking myself about workforce engagement you refer to you know manufacturing and things like that but engagement is something that is required and needed in all types of different industries I mean every single industry today is focusing in on some type of employee engagement opportunity and issue so when you start thinking about the translation and the, and the transposing some of the work that you're doing into other areas, what could you see as a potential barrier for that happening? Because I don't see any. For it happening in other areas besides manufacturing? Take your there work. is none. There yeah. is none because the, the engagement issue is a human issue. It's all about people. And that's what's common, whether you're in manufacturing or teaching or sales. And um, it's interesting. When I was doing the research for the book, um, of all of the information out in the marketplace about engagement, less than 5% of it is in manufacturing. Uh, the majority of the research and the majority of the, of the surveys and the data and the compilations and the, the Gallup reviews, uh, the vast majority of it is non-manufacturing. Okay, so that lends me to believe um, 
you know, a couple different things and I don't necessarily want to speculate, but I, you know, the going back to the manufacturing world, which quite frankly has impacted every other industry is, you know, we had the whole, what I call the Taylorism effect. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, we, we had the humans that were required to produce, you know, some type of work output. Uh, and that's just the way that they were actually viewed. Well, engagement doesn't necessarily take into consideration uh, or in order for you to be engaged, you know, you, you, you have to kind of pull away from that Taylorism, you know, and the issues associated with it. So manufacturing is, you know, definitely more geared towards the whole Taylorism piece. So I, I would dare to say when you start talking about in the book, you know, some of the eclectic management skills, uh, you talk about lost skills, share a little bit about what those lost skills are. Well, I, I talk about two of them. Actually, there's probably several, but there's there's two that I really focused in on. And uh, the one that I find that's most common is uh, the inability to delegate. Uh, people don't delegate, they assign. Uh, and the difference being they, they kind of put boundaries on people that don't allow them to, to respond properly. Uh, at the core of the difference between delegation and assignment is uh, a very simple concept. And that is a, a person who delegates well tells his people what he wants to do and why he wants to do it. On the other hand, he leaves the how they go about doing it to them. After all, they're the ones who are doing it. They should be the experts in the field. And uh, what I find is there's too much micromanagement and too much uh, weak delegation where they not only tell people what to do and seldom tell them why. Usually that's a missing piece. And then the third thing is, they, they imbue them with all the hows that it, it needs to be done, and very often they box them in so, so they've got a situation where uh, they, they give them an assignment, but it can't be done because the resources and the methods conflict with the, with the overall objectives. Okay, so when I start looking at, and you talk about it in the book, the systems, the systematic approach, the systems thinking associated with workforce engagement, what are some of the things that kind of stand out to you as – uh, again, I want to say opportunities. I mean, we, we, we see that we have a lot of them. And I don't want to keep focusing in on the negative aspects. We have a lot of opportunity when it comes to workforce engagement. Where do you see them? Well, you know, I think the biggest thing is for people to simplify and humanize their thinking. One of the first things I do when I'm teaching people workforce engagement is I ask them, you know, tell me about something that you can do that you can do all day long, maybe even through the night. And what is it that, that gets you going about that thing? And so people will talk about their hobbies and, and all kinds of their avocations instead of their vocation. And, uh, and so what I find out is if you can get people thinking about and answering the question, why is it that some of your people can get deeply involved in hobbies? What is it about the hobby that causes them to do it? What is it about volunteer activities? Some of your people, uh, I've, I've had discussions with managers who will spend 20, 30, 40 hours a week outside of their job as a volunteer doing basically what they would do anyway in their normal job, but they just go crazy doing it the volunteer activity. Uh, I just recently spoke to a guy who's an accountant for a church, and he hates his accounting job, but he loves his job at the church. It's the same thing. What's the difference? As soon as, you, as soon as you encapsulate and understand those differences, then it's pretty easy to translate that into making changes in your culture, making changes in your workplace, so your people can be not, not just productive, but healthy, healthy and happy about it. Well, to me, that I think leads into where, what you were talking about in the book, going into the six eclectic management skills. So share a little bit about what those are. Well, the, 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 the skills are... I just call them eclectic skills because they're, they're skills that people, I think, are, are, are taught in most of their management training, but they're not emphasized enough. Um, and and when, you, when you emphasize them and you focus in on them, you get to the heart and you get to the core of what causes people to, to do what they do. Um, the last one, the key one to me is just, just amazing, and I call it uh, uh, questioning and integration. Being able to, instead of tell people what to do, ask them about things. And then learning from that, create a, an ongoing dialogue where you can take the best of both people and integrate it into a common solution. 
So when I start, you know, looking at, you know, what you talk about, those two law skills, converting them into more of the modern skills and what we're seeing as far as the workforce is concerned, where, where are you finding that most people, you know, are seeing some gains in? Uh, you know, strangely enough, uh, the biggest impact I've seen, particularly recently, and I, I think it's just because I'm more tuned into it and I'm paying a great deal of attention to it, is that managers have lost the concept that they're also supervisors. And they spend their time worrying about the machines and, the, and particularly the finances, and they're forgetting about the people. And, and uh, one of my mentors along the way told me, he said, Lonnie, you take care of the people, they'll take care of everything else. And uh, I think people have lost, a lot of managers have lost that. And they're myopically viewing the, the spreadsheets and the balance sheets and the monthly reports and the quarterly quarterly profits and forgetting how they got there. Well, and on the service side, I mean, you in the book, you talk about the power of the frontline supervisor. And I think mm -hmm. that's kind of hitting on there uh, is that, you know, when you start getting outside of the manufacturing world, um, you know, you start talking about, especially in today's economy uh, for us in the States, it's, you know, about servicing. It's about providing some type of service. And, you know, the, at that front line, you know, level, a lot of it is about, you know, handling or managing the interaction. You know, it's, it's doing mm -hmm. transactions. You know, it's, it's doing, you know, something as a, you know, a point in time delivery of a service, you know, and then therefore moving on to yet, you know, something else. And there's still metrics associated with that. It's like, you know, okay, so how many times did you do that in the hour? How long did it take you? All of, you know, all of those metric components that the frontline supervisor may be looking at. So, and, and one of the things that we often find too in the servicing world is that, you know, the person who was actually the, the individual contributor moved up to that position of that frontline leader, you know, and then therefore the skill development did not come along with it. That's why I created, you know, the call center coach uh, leadership academy for customer service operations and contact centers is because typically it's a sink or swim scenario. So when you start talking though about the shift that has happened in the past couple decades, and the people who are moving into the front line today versus people who moved into the front line, say, 20 years ago, what are they dealing with today that they've never had to deal with before? Uh, oh, wow. Good question. I, I really hadn't thought about that a great deal. But uh, I, I think structurally, in terms of getting the work done, I don't think there's a great deal of difference. If you're a manufacturing first-line manager, um, th that that is – kind of the same old stuff if you but but however in today's world people have changed a lot particularly since the like say the 50s if you go back several decades um, at that time people were intrinsically loyal uh, they were just pleased as could be to have a job um, and now it's it's different you know and, and people used to think of a job as a as a way to get money and now a job is a way to get money and then have the time to be able to use it and so, so there's a whole other dynamic that's, that's coming into play. Um, and, and, but the, the big advantage that we really haven't captured, uh, and I mean North America, South America, I see the problem in Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, Canada, everywhere, is that 50 or 60 years ago, a lot of these people came to work at the, at the entry level as a machinist or as a call center person. Um, some of them didn't even have a, a high school education. And now these people not only have high school educations, a lot of them have two-year degrees, four-year degrees that maybe are not, maybe they got a degree in literature and they're working in their manufacturing plant, but they're talented. They're immensely talented, much more talented than they, than they were before. And, and if there's one thing that my Japanese clients, almost to the client, do better than my Western clients is that they tap in to that knowledge base. They tap into that motivation of those people. They tap into their desire to make things better. They tap into their desire to contribute and, and thereby put all kinds of other people to work at innovation and creativity. Uh, so I, I think singularly that's the biggest thing that I've seen over the last several years is can these supervisors unleash that talent in their people? Okay, well that brings the whole question of motivation, the science of motivation, you know, the leading and the managing of motivation into play. So when you talk about motivation, what does that mean from your perspective? 
Well, interestingly enough, uh, one of the things I, I teach the three rules of motivation. I discuss them at length in my book. But the, the first rule is don't try to motivate people. Okay? They come to work motivated. And, and people say, well, they're not motivated now. Well, that's because of the way in which they were, they were handled while they were there. And, and people don't feed their own intrinsic motivators. They don't give them the opportunity to be autonomous. They don't give them the opportunity to show their competence and grow their competence. And then people become demotivated. And the second rule is don't demotivate the people. And there's a, a million ways in which people demotivate people. And, and very often, the sad part of it is they demotivate them by doing things that they design that are well-intentioned. They're just wrong. They try to bribe them with parking spots and tickets to the hockey game. And the people don't need to be bribed. What they need to do is have the opportunity to contribute at the workplace. And then the third rule is learn to use the intrinsic motivators. And, and that's the key. That's why people love this volunteer work. And that's why people love doing their hobbies because they activate these intrinsic motivators. As a matter of fact, an interesting thing I learned while I was researching the book, uh, one, of the, one of the people who's a, a landmark psychologist in, in the field of uh, intrinsic motivation is a fellow named Dr. Edward Desi at Rochester University of Minnesota, uh, Rochester Tech, pardon me. And, uh, and he clued me in. He said, Lonnie, these are not intrinsic motivators. These are intrinsic needs. And the difference being, if they're satisfied, health and well-being ensue. If they're, if they're truncated, then, then ill health, some form of illness happens. It might be stress. It might be anxiety. It might be depression. It might be boredom. He said boredom is the most common one. And uh, so the psychologists don't talk about intrinsic motivators. They talk about intrinsic needs. And when that finally gelled in my mind and set in, I, I said, wow, this is a revelation. Okay, so that leads me to believe as you're t or, or to think about something as you were talking where somebody was asking the question, what is um, a more powerful way in order to be able to engage people? Is it by incentives or is it, or is it by um, re rewards? I think there was other question. And my reply was neither. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, um, there's, there's a great article written by a guy by the name of Hertzberg. Uh, I forget Hersberg's first name, but um, the, the subtitle is interesting. It says, and it was talking about workforce motivation, and it said, forget the incentives, forget the awards, uh, make, it, make the workplace fun for the individual. And, and, and they don't mean fun in terms of, you know, playing basketball and shooting hoops. They mean satisfying the intrinsic motivators. And then Hersberg goes on to talk about that, and he developed something that's very, very uh, popular in, in, uh, in the world of psychology that managers should deeply understand, but almost don't. I mean, I, I find very few who do it. And it's what they call Hertzberg's two-factor theory. And uh, he says there's, there's hygiene factors, which are things that, if satisfied, create almost nothing. If they're not satisfied, they create dissatisfaction. Things like money, benefits, and stuff. And, uh, and then there are motivators, and all of his motivators are the intrinsic motivators a sense of accomplishment, uh, a sense of recognition, competency, the work itself. And uh, his theories have been proven time and time and time again. They're, they're golden. And, and the bad news about that is he was writing in the 50s. And it's still not well understood or grasped. Well, I mean, for me, when I start looking at this from a societal perspective, I mean, you know, a couple of things come out to play is that we want the quick fix, right? Um, you know, just let me get to the performance, whatever it takes. That's one thing, you know, and not create, you know, a harm as far as bodily harm. Um, you know, and then, and then the other thing, you know, is associated with the whole, um, you know, the, the, the sheer money that is actually spent into rewards and recognition programs. I mean, we're talking billions of dollars. How do you fight against that? Uh, it's kind of an uphill battle because this concept of extrinsic rewards, money, parking spots, hockey tickets, you know, uh, passes to the, to the theater and that type of stuff for, for improved performance of a cell or a line or even a whole plant. Um, uh, it all, obviously people like that because they get some kind of a short-term benefit. Out of it. But, uh, you know, immediately after the hockey game, they forgot what it was about and where it came from. And they just don't work. As a matter of fact, there's a very interesting 
and revealing book written by a guy by the name of Alfie Cohn, K-O-H-N. And it's called Punished by Rewards. And he, he goes through how the reward system in schools, you know, gold stars and ABC letters uh, actually work tremendously to demotivate people and, and discourage them from, from activating. And so the, I, when, I, when I try to teach this concept of motivation, I just ask a manager. I said, okay, you know, you're making $350,000 a year. If I paid you a million bucks, would you be three times smarter? Would you work three times harder? And they'll, to a person, tell you, you know, I'm giving it all I got. And the next question, the follow-up question and the coaching question is, okay, so what's different with, with Mary on the line? Is she not giving all she's got? Well, maybe, you know. And, and when you can get in their head, and get them to see everybody else through their own perspective, and through their perspective, uh, I've been able to make some headway with that. But sometimes that's not so easy. This concept of instant gratification is a monster. It's a monster. Well, it is. I mean, needless to say, we need a whole lot of energy and a whole lot of effort to fight the monster, uh, because we have to, if we, especially if we want that long-term value, that long-term impact. And we can't keep putting short-term fixes on a long-term problem. I mean, you know, re relationships and successful relationships and long-term relationships, you know, require, you know, a, an ongoing vision, you know, and an ongoing path. But we, we, need, we need, you know, support to be able to do that. One of the things that we look at on the show in order to support us are quotes. You know, is there a quote or two that you like that you can share? Well, one of the things when you're talking about, when you're talking about, um, uh, relationships. Um, I think it was Benjamin Franklin said, uh, success is missed by many people because it's dressed in coveralls and looks like hard work. And, and uh, another one I like was the one by John, is it Kenneth Galbraith, the economist? Uh, he said that uh, many, many people will see success, but uh, no, no. In the matter of changing one's mind, pardon me, uh, many people, you know, see the opportunity and then just get up and walk on as if nothing had happened. And, and so people can see all kinds of things that, that, that will occur. But when it comes to them changing themselves, uh, very often things like denial and things come into play. And uh, so uh, those are a couple that, that I have. I have those in, in each of my books. Well, and those are, those are very good ones. I mean, there's, there's also another one that's on um, our refrigerator wall um, that says something to the effect of, you know, I can't, I can't, something about their behavior things tells you how much time I go and spend reading the refrigerator. I'm typically got my nose in it, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it basically goes along the lines of, I can't, you know, hear what you're saying because your actions are, are drowning it out. Um, right. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's one of those things that I even made this mention the other day is, as me growing up, I always heard the statement of, you know, don't do as I do, do as I say. Um, that makes it a little bit difficult to actually do what I'm supposed to. Right. Yeah. Actually, that concept is, is uh, in, in, in my book, I talk about three uh, skill sets that people need to have. And that's one of the skill sets modeling um, that is part of the management theme. And it's the third set. It's the set that, that solidifies everything. You can get people to change in the short term, but if you want it sustained, they have to be able to see that they're willing to make the sacrifice as well as are you willing to make the sacrifice? Are you willing to change? And when that happens, and, and to be honest with you, Jim, uh, so much of this, if, if people are looking for metaphors to model, the family is a perfect one. You know, you watch, and, and I used to, play this game. I coached soccer for 32 years and, and the parents would come to the game and I'd play this game and I'd try to match the parents with the kids. And it, it, you could be, if you, if you spend a little time just looking at them and watching them, you don't even have to have a protracted discussion with them. You can, you can see the behaviors of the kids uh, as a mirror of, of what the parents have taught them. And uh, so a, a lot of management people twist and turn and try and to turn into a an incredibly complicated science, and some of it is. Make no mistake about it. But there's a lot of it that's just down-home common sense. And a lot of it you learned at home. You really did. Well, and or I, didn't. 
Well, well, that's it. I think that's some of the issues. I mean, we have, you know, so much influence from a societal perspective that is outside of the home where, where some of these things happen and occur is, uh, you know, quite really unsuspecting. I mean, I even remember going back many years ago when all of a sudden my daughter at the time who was, I don't know, six or seven years old started getting this really, you know, sarcastic, you know, type of behavior and, and was, you know, you know, really just being very curt and, you know, hurtful. And I'm like, where did all this come from? Um, and it came from a Disney show that she was watching, iCarly, where they were very, very sarcastic in their humor and stuff. I'm like, huh, quit watching that. <laughs> and that was pulled. <laughs> because the influence is just going to be, you know, something that as a parent, you definitely don't want, you know, to have, some, have them displayed. You know, and, and I would dare to say it goes back to that modeling piece, right? I mean, if all of your people are just around a certain, you know, particular type of behavior that's being modeled, you can't expect them to do something different. Yeah. So also when you start talking about, you know, you going through and getting to where you are now, being the engineer, you know, looking at it from, you know, the, 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 the lean perspective and, and all of that. I mean, I would dare to say you had a lot of humps that you had to get over that led you to where you are right now and what you believe. Is there a time that you've gotten over the hump that you can share with us? Yeah, I was, um, it was a few years back, but I was working with a firm and, and uh, we were doing a lean transformation. And um, we were doing it kind of in the classic method. Um, and it wasn't working. It wasn't working at all. And uh, the company was very, very pleased with what was going on. But if you sat back and looked at it dispassionately, you could say, we're just not making much change. And, and basically, the management was kind of so uh, ego involved in it that they couldn't see what was really going on. And so I was staring failure right smack dab in the face and I I didn't quite know what to do with it and uh, so I sat down and, and did some some discussion and uh, one of the things was I talked to my pastor and the pastor was a lady and she said uh, well I don't know what's going on but your problem is hubris and I said hmm <laughs> so I, I, I thought about that a little bit and I thought about how the managers are treating it and, and she was exactly right it really was and and what I was able to do then I said okay We've got to change this so we can turn it into a success. And so I, I figured out what we were doing wrong, and, and I knew some of the things we were doing wrong, although I thought we could overcome them. But instead, I, I came up with a ploy, and I said, we need to try some of these new techniques in an individual facility. And one of the problems that we had done is we tried to do it across a number of value streams and, and change the whole place at once. And uh, so I, I recognized that that was failing. And I also recognized that they weren't about to change it. And so what I did is I said, okay, let's try it on a small scale. So we went into one plant and we changed one plant. And in record time, it, uh, we tripled its productivity. We tripled the, the, uh, the profitability. The plant was barely hanging on with a 5% margin. Uh, the last quarter, they averaged 19%. Over the year, we got them to 14%. Morale skyrocketed. Uh, employee retention rose like crazy and uh, they were in kind of an expansion mode and hiring and and luckily as we made productivity improvements we there, there was nobody that got fired this company would have fired them in a heartbeat but they just hired less and uh, it was a uh, I'd been very very successful implementing a lot of lean initiatives and this one just didn't work and uh, so I had to uh, and I spent many sleepless nights thinking about it before before we made some changes, but we came through with this kind of subterfuge. Let's try something on a smaller scale. And then once we did it on a smaller scale, we were able to sell them that that's what we need to do everywhere. And, and they kind of backed away from their approach, at least several divisions did. And we started making significant progress. But uh, I was scared, to be honest with you. I was afraid that we weren't, it wasn't going to work. And, and it was my design and it was part of, I was part, so I was part of the problem. And uh, so that's where I, I came up with a, a, a lean mantra that, that we use in all of my transformation. And that's think small, think fast, and think lots of cycles through the PDCA cycle. Don't try to eat an elephant in one bite, you know, uh, gnaw away at it. And, uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, the sixth eclectic skill is this, is this integration. Because, because one of the things that happens is as you make change, all kinds of sympathetic changes occur 
and some is some is some is sympathetic and some is antagonistic and uh you have to be able to recognize what's going on and respond to those and uh boy when we when we went through this initiative uh, things did not go well and ultimately we we got it down to where we did it in a small place we came up with a different model of transformation and away we went well, I think what you also described right there is something that we all kind of need to take into consideration is, you know, something that, you know, we, we deploy and then we have to make some iterations and then we, you know, do some testing. You fail fast. I think you even said that a moment ago you know, yeah. before we go and, and, and hit them all. Um, and sometimes that's actually the, the path that's going to get you to your outcome faster, even though it may say, oh, well, we have to take all of our time doing that. <laughs> but you, and there was a great example of, Yes, because we wouldn't have gotten there otherwise. Yeah. And I had been doing these lean transformations for, I don't know, a dozen years at least at that time. And, and it shows you how blind you can be by being close to something. And, and one day while I was driving home from work, I thought about this transformation. It was going good. And this thought popped in my mind and it said, well, of course, stupid. That's exactly what Toyota did. They didn't have a grand plan and lay out this orchestrated, uh, you know, with a set of resources and stuff, they took on a problem, they fixed it, and then they took up another problem. And pretty soon they had some things that they found out that worked, and then they, they expanded it. And uh, when, I, when I learned that, I mean, I don't know how many books I had read about the Toyota production system at the time, but it just never dawned on me in a practical sense how it was. And so some of the stuff is not rocket science, but it's still sometimes we're blind to it. I and think- I was blind to that. Well, and I think that's a great point. Uh, so, I mean, for me, when I start thinking about you know, some of the discussion that you and I have had off mic when, when I was talking about the work that you put together here, you know, I started talking about that higher education and I started talking about academic use. I mean, because, I mean, you have a very, you know, robust, uh, deeply researched, as I, as I had mentioned it, you know, it's a te- it's, this is a textbook. Uh, so when you start talking about, you know, goals and aspirations and things that you have, um, you know, to, to, with where you are now and the work that you're doing, share with us one of, what one of those goals are. Well, I, I really have three things that I want to really accomplish uh, as I go forward. I'm in the, in the last few years working. Um, I've worked for 50 years. Uh, I can't stop because I love it. And if I did stop doing what I do, I just continue to work with nonprofits and, and, uh, and volunteer organizations which I still do a little bit of helping out my church and that type of stuff. But uh, I want people to be able to take this beast called lean manufacturing and apply it in manufacturing um, and other places. And it is just a, a fabulous tool that everybody comes out a winner. Um, It's one of the places where I tell people you can have your cake and eat it too. You can get profitability and improved quality. You can get improved morale at reduced cost. You can get uh, higher productivity and improved morale. I mean, all of these things are totally compatible. Um, but because we have a variety of, of dysfunctional paradigms, uh, a lot of people don't believe that. They think if you're going to improve the quality, you got to prepare to invest the money. Well, maybe you invest the ingenuity. Maybe you invest the time. Maybe you invest the engagement. And, and, and get it. So um, that's really one of the things that I want to do. Uh, in, and a, kind of a subset of that is that along the way, a number of people have helped me, uh, including my current mentor, who is a fellow named Toshi Amino. Toshi happens to be in Japan at the time. He usually spends six months here in the States and six months in Japan. And he was the retired vice president of, of human resources for Honda. And uh, he and I talked not so frequently now that he's in Japan, but, but we talk a lot. And, uh, and he was a tremendous mentor and, and advisor to me. And all along, uh, people have, have helped me out. And so I'd like to pay that forward and uh, let people learn from, well, my failures as well as my successes. So, Well, and the Fast Leader Legion wishes you the very best. Now, before we move on, let's get a quick word from our sponsor. An even better place to work is an easy-to-use solution that gives you a continuous diagnostic on employee engagement along with integrated activities that will improve employee engagement and leadership skills in everyone. Using this award-winning solution is guaranteed to create motivated, productive, and loyal employees who have great work relationships with their colleagues and your customers. To learn more about an even better place to work, visit beyondmorale.com forward slash better. 
Okay, here we go, Fast Leader Legion. It's time for the Hump Day Hoedown. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hump Day Hoedown is a part of our show where you give us good insights fast. So I'm going to ask you several questions. And your job is to give us robust yet rapid responses that are going to help us move onward and upward faster. Lonnie Wilson, are you ready to hoe down? Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. So what is holding you back from being an even better leader today? Oh, wow. I've got my own paradigm that I need to overcome. What is the best leadership advice you've ever received? Be a good role model. And what is one of your secrets that you believe contributes to your success? I work hard. Um, I, I, I study hard. I still read 50 or 30 to 50 books a year. Um, and, and what I've learned is that we all have blind spots. And what do you feel is one of your best tools that helps you lead in business or life? Well, I like to think that I'm a good role model. And what would be one book you'd recommend to our legion? It could be from any genre. Of course, we're going to put a link to sustaining workforce engagement on your show notes page as well. You know, I, 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 would, I can't think of one, but I can think of two, uh, particularly if you're a manager. Uh, there's a very, very good one um, written by, oh, geez, now it escapes me. Um, situational leadership, okay? And it talks about how you integrate the task these people need to do with the work that needs to be performed. And then as a supervisor, provide the link so that they can be successful. He says something that is just absolutely golden. And that is that, that the success of your people is dependent upon you as a supervisor. Your job is to make them successful. Uh, the second one is Hertzberg book. I got it on my back shelf. I could find it here in a minute, but, but the, the book by Hertzberg, he's really written several, but he talks about uh, motivation in the workplace. Okay, Fast Leader Legion, you can find links to that and other bonus information from today's show by going to fastleader.net slash Lonnie Wilson. Okay, Lonnie, this is my last Hump Day Hold On question. Imagine you were given the opportunity to go back to the age of 25, and you can take the knowledge of skills that you have now back with you, but you can't take it all. You can only choose one. So what skill or piece of knowledge would you take back with you, and why? I think one of the things that's helped me a lot as I've gotten older is I've become more empathetic. I've been able to see into people better and understand what they were doing. Um, when I was 25, uh, I didn't know everything, but there were an awful lot of things I thought I knew that I really didn't know. And as you get older, you get a little bit more humble. And uh, so I guess if, if there was one thing I would, I would like to bring back to me, uh, back to that time frame, to help me even grow better and faster would be to, to have a better sense of empathy. Lonnie, it was a pleasure to spend time with you today. How do people get in touch with you? Well, I've got a website. It's www.qc-ep.com. There's a ton of information on there, maybe 60 or 70 articles I've written, uh, props for how to develop a, a leader standard work and A3 problem solving, all kinds of, of lean tools. And it's got all my contact information. And uh, I make a deal with everybody who's a student with me. And that is that if you were ever a student with mine, you're always a student of mine. And uh, those people who are listening to this broadcast are in some level a student of mine, so they can give me a call anytime they want. Lonnie Wilson, thank you for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. The Fast Leader Legion honors you and thanks you for helping us get over the hump. Thank you for joining me on the Fast Leader Show today. For recaps, links from every show, special offers, and access to download and subscribe, if you haven't already, head on over to fastleader.net so we can help you move onward and upward faster. <laughs>